And while they're going, we're going to be in 2 Peter, chapter 2. And we have some unwanted guests with us today, so if I start acting like I've been um, filled with something else, I'm just chasing the flies away. So don't, don't worry about that. Shouldn't be that scary. Well, 2 Peter, chapter 2, the whole thing in chapter 2 uh, is dedicated to the uh, dedicated, that, that is to say the, the print is dedicated to talking about false teachers. It's not a dedication in a good way. And we get to verse 10 where we concluded the first portion, um, verses 4 through, uh, through 10. We concluded that in the middle, and you can read it as, and especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires, and they despise uh, lordship. Um, and then we begin with, in today, the second part of verse 10. Now he's explaining who they are. And he says, daring, bold, that is, and arrogant, or self-willed, these men are not afraid to slander celestial beings. Yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not bring slanderous accusations against such beings in the presence of the Lord. But these men blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They are like brute beasts, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed. And like beasts, they too will perish. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. Now, again, and I've said this in the past, if I could uh, preach love and harmony and yada, 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 I, I would, but we preach the word of God, and God doesn't pull any punches. In fact, uh, not that you have to turn there, but back in Matthew chapter 23, uh, starting in verse 13 and ending with the end of the chapter, Jesus has something to say to the scribes and the Pharisees. And I'm not going to read the whole thing because it, uh, it's just one whammy after another. But I will read two verses, verses 27 and 28, which is kind of like right in the middle of how Jesus addresses the scribes and the Pharisees. And he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, Hypocrites! You feeling uncomfortable so far? Because <laughs> he's, he's addressing all the guys in their white robes with their uh, hats and their uh, stance and their full beards and their phylacteries. And, and uh, he says, woe to you! Right? This isn't good news. Scribes and Pharisees, <laughs> hypocrites! I mean, you're called scribes and Pharisees. Pharisees, but what you really are, are hypocrites. And he says, for you are white, like whitewashed sepulchers, or tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you too outwardly appear righteous to man, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Let me just ask you, if you were a scribe and a Pharisee, and you heard that, would you have an opinion? <laughs> he just called me a hypocrite. The only problem is that it was 100% true. Because on the outside, you know, oh, that's Pastor Wayne. See, he's got the tie. Well, that's odd. I saw him at the grocery store the other day, and he was yelling at a clerk and had his finger pointed in the face of the supervisor, and... And uh, there was somebody, you know, standing there crying. That's the pastor. That's the scribes and Pharisees. They're like tombs, clean on the outside. And, of course, on the inside <coughs> is death. So we look 
at 2 Peter chapter 10, and Peter begins to unfold, unpack chapter 2, verse 10. Okay, that was a mistake, but I caught it, so you don't get a dollar. <laughs> if you had waited until next week. <laughs> That's what happens when you have sharp people in the audience. <laughs> he begins, and he calls them darers, bold. And this is, in a bad sense, presumptuous, audacious people. There's a phrase, someone is uh, not afraid to go where angels fear to tread. And I'm pretty confident that it fits well in this. There's some surprises in this first statement in uh, the last part of verse 10. Darers, self-pleasing or arrogant, uh, they do not tremble when blaspheming something. And we'll, we'll get to that. So what do we have here? We have false teachers, and we know that because this is in the context of verse 1, where he began, and there came about among the people, referring to the Old Testament Jews, false prophets. There will be false teachers among you as well. And then he proceeds to all the way uh, to where we are here in verse 10, and he continues now to describe them, and he says they're darers, they're bold and they are self-pleasing. Interesting word. Self-pleasing, willful, obstinate, arrogant, imperious, one who pleases himself. You know, as I was just sitting there looking at all of this, I'm looking at these people, and sometimes I'm just in awe, not out of respect, but I'm in awe of how much they think of themselves. I am so much more important than you. I'll take the time to draw breath in your general direction just because I have to, but uh, as soon as this uh, un uncomfortable encounter is done, I'm going to move past you. If I have to move over you, I will. Either way, it doesn't matter to me because you are unimportant. I, on the other hand, am very important. <coughs> And that's the whole gist of where we're going with this. That's, that's the whole demeanor that Peter gives us here. These guys um, have, have something going on. They do not tremble when blaspheming something. And I'll get to that something in a moment. But this whole matter of not trembling is the not being afraid. Remember back in the second... Um, exhortation of first Peter there was uh, starting in verse 16 it was you be uh, holy for I am holy and then he moves on in the second uh, exhortation uh, to fear to fear the Lord to show respect to God that's us that's what we are to do that's who we are that's who he is and we recognize ourselves in appropriate relationship with him he is God and I am not he deserves it, and I don't. If I am going to get it, it's because of his goodness. He loves me like crazy. When we find here that these darers, that these arrogant, self-willed, self-pleasing people do not tremble, there is no respect here for where we're going in this. When they blaspheme, and this word blaspheme, I really believe that we need to keep it as that. It's, it's um, the word slander is a different word and it, and it has a different meaning. It, slander is a part of blasphemy, but blasphemy is not necessarily a part of slander. So I want us to look in the direction of the word that we more or less understand to be blasphemy, and it's to speak of God or divine things in terms that are impious, irreverence, uh, with irreverence. A lack of respect for God, uh, either, either uh, bringing him down to man's level, which is blasphemy, ignoring him, which is blasphemy, uh, making fun of him, which is blasphemy, uh, ignoring him, which is blasphemy. I mean, all of those things and more uh, 
are, are, are blasphemy. It's not just calling God a bad name. And these people do not tremble when blaspheming something. Now, in the, um, in the NIV, it's celestial beings. In the New American Standard, it's angelic majesties. The problem with both of those is that they take words that, in a sense, have equivalent uh, words in the Greek, and they, they kind of make it say there. The word that is used here is glories. Well, glories is an unusual word. It just is. Uh, first of all, it's plural. And so what do you do with that? Well, that's, that's why I believe that the translators translated this unusual word glories as, as angelic beings or celestial beings or angelic majesties. But I disagree. And I, of course, I always do that respectfully. But uh, keep in mind that the word glory, just by itself, as we um, find it in relation to it in God's name in some way, and I'll read some of those in just a moment. The singular glory always denotes the sum of divine attributes shining forth. So we have in Acts 7 and again in Ephesians 1.17, God, Father of the glory, of the glory. Okay, and uh, so we leave that hanging there for a minute. And in James chapter 2, verse 1, we have Jesus Christ of the glory. And in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13, we have the revelation of his glory. And in uh, 1, Peter chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8, we have the Lord of the glory. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14, we have the spirit of the glory and of God. So we have this um, reference to glory... In, in relation to something that pertains to God. And it's a little bit difficult for us in our humanity to even grip hold of it because whenever you try to describe God, you kind of almost have to describe him in, in connection with his attributes. Well, God is glorious. And does that mean the effulgence of light? Yes. Does that mean the, the effervescence of power? Yes. Does that mean the over, uh, uh, out there, can't think of the word, uh, that goes with all the knowledge? Uh, is that a part of the glory? Yes. So you, you see, it's hard to compact all of this down into a nice, neat little package. Here, this is the glory of God. Get it? Yeah, it's pretty big. It is. When we come to the glories, I believe that those are referring to all the things that collectively shine forth and out of the person and the work of Jesus Christ in his humanity while he walked among us on the earth. <clears throat> but can I possibly limit glories to that? Or can I, should I, uh, also reach out through his humanity, through his divinity, out into eternity in either direction? I think I should. So I believe, and this is what I'm proclaiming to you this morning, preaching to you this morning, is that when we read in verse 10 that uh, these false teachers, these, these darers, these uh, self-pleasing, self-willed, arrogant people show no respect when they blaspheme angels? Can I say, who cares? Or... Can we understand this word, which is glories, to be that which Jesus Christ was and showed us and explained to us and exhibited uh, while he walked with us on the face of the earth? I go with that. So when you see in the NIV and the uh, New American Standard uh, celestial beings or angelic majesties, um, that's how they interpreted the word glories. And I, I'm not going to castigate them for that. I'm simply going to say that I believe that the glories refer to the glories that are always associated with Jesus, with God the Father, with the Holy Spirit, uh, as they've been explained uh, in previous scriptures. And that sets us up then to verse 2. 
And part of the reason that I believe that the NIV and the New American Standard translated it as, as something that refers to uh, the angels is because the very next thing is where or whereas angels, so they, they connect those. And I understand how they did it, but uh, I still have to struggle because it doesn't say angels, it says glories, and I'm going to stick with what I've already explained. So we move on into verse 11, and we have, um, we begin to, to compare the attitude of, of these bold false teachers, these arrogant false teachers, these self-pleasing false teachers, and, and we go to angels. We've already kind of dealt with them once in verse 4. We're not going back there again. But angels, remember, are higher than us. The psalm makes it very clear that uh, what is man, that thou art mindful of him, uh, you know, it's created to him a little lower than the angels. Okay, so that's how he created us. Angels are perfect, we are not. The differences, however, are great. And the angels uh, stand in the presence of God because they are also <laughs> perfect. And they're beautiful. And they can reflect his glory and they can give him glory. And they can also, not can, but they must minister to him. And here, that's where he goes. He says, where, uh, you know, that's where they are, the, the false teachers, but where angels are being greater in strength and power. And sometimes I get really confused. Even there's two completely different words here. And one of them, the power is dunamis. And years ago when I was uh, teaching through uh, Ephesians, I believe, because I couldn't find it to explain the differences, because they both, in essence, are um, strength, might, power, power, strength, ability. It's like, okay. And I believe that the, the might, which is the first word, is strength, power, and might, whereas the second word, I believe, has to do with the administration and the execution, uh, the application of that uh, might. And I'm going to leave it there. However you want to look at it or explain it or simply say it's saying the same thing in two different words just to emphasize it, that's fine with me as well. But the point is that the angels are greater than these false prophets in pretty much everything that we would kind of consider that matters. I mean, strength and power, isn't that kind of one of man's biggest thingies about himself? You know, I can still open the thing of, thing of milk. That's, a, that's actually becoming important because that's getting harder. I'm pretty strong. These angels, however, greater. You need to feed them before church. <laughs> Sorry. Typically, I behave myself, but sometimes I don't. So. Where or whereas angels are greater in strength and power, even these beings do not bring against them blasphemous judging uh, before the Lord. And that's kind of an interesting uh, movement of thought here that Peter brings. I'm not saying any of this stuff is easy. I did scratch my head quite a bit this week. Angels, higher than men, being greater in strength and power, that's what they are, do not bring. They could, but I think there's an element here, and this is a part of the point really regarding angels, is there's a humility and there's an obedience in the angelic realm. They are going to do the will of God no matter how, uh, can I use the word stupid, humans are. And God has given them dictates. I believe that all of us have our own angel to facilitate the will of God around us, so uh, a part of that, I don't, I don't want to go any further than that, that's not my message this morning, but I believe that there's a humility and an obedience <laughs> among these angels that they're not going to, though they could, they could step in and deal with things, but they do not bring against them reproachful judging before the Lord. So the angels know what's going on, and we, we understand that angels are powerful beings. Uh, we have those stories. So there's a reason that we sit back in awe when we are confronted with an angel in the scriptures. 
when we see people falling on their faces and so on. It's not because they're uh, wussy little um, cupids, you know, with a little bow. Ding! And then you're going to have hearts coming out of you. Uh, I think angels have swords, not bows. And I think those swords do things. So in verse 11, we have this um, uh, heaven's throngs could but won't or could but don't step in. And so we, we split these things out now. We have the false teachers over here boldly going where angels would fear to tread and angels over here with the complete ability to take care of business, but they don't. And we need to step back and look at these false teachers as men, uh, and I said it last week more than once, uh, these false teachers, they're having their time. Whatever they have now, that's what, that's what they get. That's it. And so they better enjoy it. Verse 12 has nothing good to say, followed by verse 13 with nothing good to say. So in verse 12, we have, but these as irrational animals, and that's what they are, this, um, this matter of um, unreasoning, it, it's literally without speech or reason, it's irrational, it's brute. And growing up on the farm, you know, we had various animals. Some of them were very smart, like the pig and the dog, and some of them were very stupid, like the cow and the chicken. Come here, chicken. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. Come here, cow. I'll wait. Is that a way to go? I'll go over there. <laughs> and that's kind of the, the picture here. Uh, Peter is, there's, there's no compliment in here. The brute, irrational beast. And what were they, what are beasts born for? And I'm careful with this for all you animal lovers, but when he gets down to it, they are for capture and for perishing. And that word perishing isn't the same word that we've seen in the past for perishing. It's, it's an interesting word uh, to spoil, to ruin, to corrupt. Um, God made animals uh, overall to be under us. We have dominion over animals. And so animals are not born to rule the world. Um, they are born to be under us for a purpose of service or servicing humankind. So the false teachers do not deserve uh, any deference by the angels. Their purpose is anything but noble. It is ignoble. Uh, they are like brute beasts limited to animal nature whose end is capturing and ruin. We move on from that and we find that... Uh, Blaspheming in connection with things they are ignorant of. You wonder, uh, you wonder these people that make fun of God publicly, or make fun of God's people. In a, in a, I mean, it's not the same, but uh, that's a part of the blasphemy is making fun of God's people. What God really talks to you? Oh, what does He do? You know that kind of thing. Um, this isn't a matter of, uh, you know, I show up at 11 o'clock and it started at 10. And uh, I showed up at 11 because I was ignorant of the fact that the time had changed to 10. No, no one told me. This isn't that kind of thing. Uh, this ignorance, this without knowledge, without knowing, uh, everybody can know. The heavens declare the glory of God. So in these uh, daring, these bold, these self-willed, uh, self-proclaimed, self-important attitude that these uh, false teachers have, they remain ignorant. Uh, they, they make certain choices. Can you hear the gospel in America if, you, if you're not close to a local church? Of course you can. Of course you can. You ever heard of television or radio? And what happens if you have no outside witness? You're by yourself, 
uh, out beyond uh, California Valley, somewhere where there's no, you have no television, no radio, no cell phone coverage, um, no access, somebody drops your food in from the air. Uh, can you find God? Absolutely, you can find God. He de he's declared himself in the heavens. Actually, he's declared himself in so many ways, it's unbelievable, but I'm grateful for that. So they blaspheme things that they don't get because they don't want to. And the, the, this last part, and beginning here, I sat there with the Greek words and the definitions and the tenses, and then I looked at the various translations, and it's kind of like everybody's, everybody's playing baseball, but... You know, you got most of the team over there on one and some of the team here for the other and then somebody over here and I'm looking and saying, Lord, between the Greek and the English, I feel about as uh, uh, in, insufficient to get this as uh, somebody who can't read. And then I, then I read something that said that this, this portion gives everybody difficulty. So I'm just going to say this, the last portion, just enjoy it in whatever translation you're using because it's close and it's close enough that these are the ideas so they blaspheme in connection with what they're ignorant of and in this their perishing shall even perish and you kind of go huh what yeah that's what I was doing so this is how I did that the blasphemy that they don't that they don't understand uh, the things they don't get, uh, all of their all of their blasphemy and blaspheming is going to go to the way of the dodo bird. Um, in other words, as a human, and standing there with their fists shaking in God's face, it's all going to it's all going to disappear. In other words, they cannot win. So anybody today that uh, makes fun of God or makes fun of God's people or, or wants to make it impossible for you to buy Bibles in California, all those people, they're, even their perishing is going to perish. There's going to be there's only dust left, and no one notices dust unless companies come over. <laughs> but that's another story. Verse 13. Again, same thing, this, this portion, up until we get to the second part of 13. The, the end of 12, beginning of 13, uh, interesting word order, interesting words. So, uh, suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong, or um, they will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Uh, that's, that works. Um, but their intent is is um, their, <laughs> their intent is that they're going to do wrong. And that's going to be their wage. What, what's sad is that they, in a sense, they don't mind the result. You can go back to Romans chapter, I believe it's chapter 3. Not only do they revel in what they do, but they're very happy that you participate in the same thing. So in verse 13, you have suffering wrong as the wages for doing wrong. And then they count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. This is fascinating to me. Because they're, back to the last thing I said, their intent is to be paid in unrighteous things. Because that's what they want. But this is their sensual pleasure is out in the open. And they don't care. They don't mind. In fact, their intent is to bring it out in the open. And I don't even want to say it because immediately that's where our minds will go. But uh, we take the darkness and the sin and the sensual pleasures and the rejection of God. And we take it out of the closet and into the open. And we call it good. Sorry, not we. We. 
So that this this goes from bad to worse. Is that even possible? He says there at the end, they are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you. And there's probably much more to say on that, but I'm going to praise it down to this statement. They corrupt the fellowship of the church. Keep in mind, these are false teachers. And keep in mind, we've already been through so much of this with the many in verse 2. Who are the many? They're not the Buddhists, and they're not the uh, animists, and they're not the idol worshipers. These are people within the realm of God's truth and God's church. They're within the realm of that. So they're within close proximity to what I'm standing behind, the pulpit. They're within close proximity to God's people, the sheep of his pastors. And what do they do with that? And that's the terror and the horror and the sadness, again, that is associated with this, with this chapter. Last night, uh, before I went to bed, I, um, I came across Park Hill's, um, uh, what do you call it, subscription in YouTube, whatever it's called. Um, and then on the side you have options to look at somebody else, and I, I found a Christian man who has stood for Jesus, and I listened to one of his messages, and it, it was interesting. Um, and I'm not going to share the name of the, of the guy, because I actually respect him. And when I say this, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that what he said was heresy. He, he didn't say anything that was heretical or blasphemous. But I noticed as he went through, and, it, and this was a substantial church he was speaking in, that uh, he shared a story. And it was a story that had faith and hope as part of the theme. But interestingly enough, as I, as I listened, and I don't question whether this man is saved or not, but as I listened, I, I, I never heard Jesus. I, I never heard the reason for the season, so to speak. The reason for the conclusion or the uh, object of our faith or, or how we can have hope. Uh, it... it it saddened me that this man, who I, I respect and I like, and he's one that, uh, if he is given any more movies, uh, he's the one that uh, may kiss, but he'll, he'll never un undress. Uh, he has made that very clear. I, but I was saddened, and that's my point, that not that his message was in any way blasphemous, it didn't, it didn't bring God down to man le man's level or anything, but I thought, what a waste of time to have that many people not sit under the message of God's word. Even if it's this kind of passage where there's a denunciation of heretical leaders being given. It's not that we all take joy in this, but the thing is, and the bottom line in all of this is that the reason this is so unpleasant for us is that Jesus has been removed uh, by, these, by these guys as the reason. If he's even in the realm of an option, and we found back in chapter, uh, verse 1 rather of chapter 2, that they deny even the master who bought them. So in some way, in somewhere in there, and I'm, I'm not saying, again, that this man was heretical. I'm just saying that I was disappointed that he had an option to elevate and raise the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And it may have been in there somewhere, back, back over here, but it wasn't in the fore. And so anybody could listen to it and, sorry, could not be offended. Because it's, it's good for you. I'm glad you have hope. I'm glad you have faith. I have hope and I have faith. See my car? It's like, you get the point. So let's finish up here. So in verse 13, their intent is to be paid in unrighteous things. Uh, their sensual pleasure is out in the open and they corrupt the fellowship that you and I possess in his church around 
uh, Jesus Christ, the head, our head. So, verse 10, life is all about the false teachers. In verse uh, 11, angels don't even treat them as they treat Jesus. Angels who are higher than us don't treat them the way that the cre creatures treat the Creator. Verse 3, as animals, they blaspheme what they don't understand. And the problem is, they have to have access to the truth in order to make it perverse. And so if they don't understand it, it's because they don't want to. And finally, in verse 4, everything about them corrupts God's church. Everything. As I think of this church, and I think of you, and I pray for you, um, and I study God's word, and I deal with the whole matter that this isn't fun. It's not fun for me. And yet, I realize that all of this affects us every single day that we draw breath. Because as I've said before, we live in a world where falsehood is the norm. And you and I get to deal with truth as close as possible as the Holy Spirit gives us understanding of his revelation. So, let's give ourselves to him and uh, uh, prepare ourselves to walk with him as we walk out these doors. Father, you've given us this time this morning in your word, and we're grateful. Father, may we, as your people, always be attentive to that which is false and never fall under its woo, no matter how good it sounds. May we always, by your spirit, be prepared to confront and combat that which is, well, evil, because it blasphemes your name or sets you aside in some second-class or third-class position. Uh, help us in that, Lord, because you are our friend, and you desire the best for uh, your friends, for your sheep. So go before us as we depart. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen.